Welcome to the Skillick Explains Finance video. This week, how a pension drawdown works. Big phrase, important phrase, let's take a look at it. Now, accumulation versus drawdown, lots of jargon here. So when people talk about those two phrases and they are banded around a lot, what are they referring to? Well, the way I see it is this. Basically, you're aiming to build a lifetime savings pot which will cover you in the phase of your life where you've got financial freedom and are no longer working. So, to give it the jargon, the accumulation phase is not what I'm talking about here. That's building your pension assets. It's the drawdown phase we're looking at and where drawdown fits into the overall picture. Because drawdown may be just one part of the way you fund your retirement. Now, retirement does not mean you just stop planning, you stop investing. You still need potentially an active strategy. You need a rainy day fund in cash to see you through those emergency situations. You'll need to identify predictable cash requirements. Have you got debt to clear? Do you want to travel? Will you, will you need to fund care? And some of these require careful estimates because you won't know until you get there necessarily. And how much retirement income will your portfolio generate? So therefore, anyone who thinks I don't need a strategy for investing in retirement is wrong. And you could be retired for 20 or 30 years. So managing your portfolio is as vital in retirement as it was when you were building it before retirement. Now, key questions, just cover them in brief here. As you travel through the previous slide, if you like, you'll need to keep an eye on, what am I worth? You'll need to monitor your asset position and how drawdown is affecting it. In other words, you know, will I run out of money is a pretty key question. And what will directly impact that is how much do I need to spend in retirement and what are my other commitments, my foreseeable big calls on capital. And that all requires careful budgeting and planning. Now, where does drawdown fit into the overall picture? For a lot of people, drawdown isn't the only solution, if you like, to where's my income going to come from. In your mid-60s, and that keeps rising, there will be, I can't guarantee it of course, some sort of state pension for most people. For some lucky few, there'll be a defined benefit income potentially. Now, if you happen to work for an employer all your career that pays a final salary pension, lucky you, but for some people they'll have done that for a chunk of their career, so that'll be one part of the picture. The bit I'm gonna focus on here is really over this side of the slide. In other words, outside of those two, a lot of people will have saved through a personal pension, like a self-invested personal pension, and drawdown is part of how you manage that asset in retirement. And then you may have non-pension assets. You may have investments held within ISIS, for example, or just in broader portfolios that don't have a tax shelter over the top of them. And drawdown could be part of the way you manage those assets too. Now, under the pension freedom rules, so looking at, say, someone who's got a self-invested personal pension, built up a lump sum, what can they do with that lump sum? Just a reminder, you can take cash out, you can swap the cash there for an annuity. I'm not going to look at that in this presentation. That's handing over the money to a life insurance company in return for an income. But we are going to take a look at the other option that's now available under pension freedoms, leaving money invested and drawing off either income or capital. Don't forget, the first 25% you take out is tax free under any of these scenarios, if you like, and the rest is taxable at your marginal income tax rate. So although in retirement you won't be paying national insurance contributions, that's the good news, you will be paying income tax. And don't forget that when making the decision. Now, simple example, let's focus on drawdown here. Simple example, you've got a pot of 200,000 pounds to invest. How much income can you afford to draw off it? So you've saved that in the accumulation phase. What will that buy you? Well, it depends. This is the tricky bit about drawdown. It's not straightforward. It needs managing, it needs you to think. Okay? You need to make assumptions first of all. How many years do you need this to last? Will you get any growth on it? You probably will. Don't just draw your pension out and stick it in cash, that's madness. 20 to 30 years down the line, you could be earning decent returns. So basically, what real growth rate are you going to assume? And have you identified all your foreseeable calls on capital that might reduce this £200,000 at various points anyway? Now, the amount that £200,000 will give you as an income depends on the assumption you make. If you were to look at just income only, so I'm just going to pull off the income, it all depends what rate of income you're earning as to what that will give you per year. All right? So these are assumed growth rates, definitely not guaranteed, but 2% pure income would give you about £4,000 before tax, 4% £8,000 and at 6% £12,000. All right? 
If, on the other hand, you were to simply leave the £200,000 in cash, which I don't recommend, and divide it up into, say, 30 years. Why 30 years? That's my estimated period over which you're going to need it. It equates to about 6667. All right? So here we're just looking at pure income only or pure capital only. All right? Now, if you're thinking, well, I'll, I'll keep the £200,000 in the bank all right, and take the return off it, just draw off income, the problem with that is this. Inflation is going to erode the value of that £200,000 as it sits there. So going back 30 years, £200,000 in 1987, rolling forward using Bloomberg's RPI data, is only worth around £72,000 in 2016. Don't forget that. If you take the capital-only route and start drawing off capital, don't forget that each of those 6667s will be worth less and less and less as you travel through retirement. And that's got to be factored in too. If it's looking a bit more complicated than it first looked, well, it is. Now, let's say you assume 30 years, you're going to spend a lot, so you're going to spend down the £200,000, you're not going to leave any behind. How much could you draw off at those three growth rates? This is blending income and capital, all right? Now, you don't know you're going to get these growth rates, and indeed, they might vary, which I'll deal with in just a moment. But here, you can see with a bit of simple maths, nearly £9,000 at 2%, £11,500 at 4%, and around £14,500 at 6%, a comparison with just dividing up the £200,000 if it's left in the bank, which I wouldn't particularly recommend. But you can see by investing, let's say you can achieve 4% real returns, you're getting a significantly higher income than just by leaving it in the bank, and that's important. Now, the problem with investing, of course, is managing income fluctuations, because are you going to get 4% every year? Probably not, as that graph shows. The general trend in income from assets that include bonds, equity UK income and real estate, well, that's too small to see, but it doesn't matter. The overall trend is basically down, and income can fluctuate over time from almost any asset class. So you might need to think, as part of your drawdown solution, about rolling up income in good years to cover bad ones, diversifying across different asset classes that behave differently, and kicking the tires to make sure you're not taking too much investment risk as you travel. All things to think about as part of a drawdown strategy. Now, balancing asset classes. So where am I going to find this balanced income? Good question. For most people, it'll be a blend of cash, the rainy day fund, IOUs and shares, plus maybe some property. The more exotic stuff won't be the source of income for most people, what I call the alternatives, but just list them for completeness. And you've got a choice the way you do it. You can basically have direct holdings in things like shares, all right, or you can have an indirect holding via a fund. So again, not going to cover it here, but lots of ways that potentially you can be generating this drawdown income and or capital. Now, a quick comparison. So how do you make the decision? You might think, well, I'll pile into shares, 100%. Maybe not. I'll explain why in a moment. Because although comparing a basket of UK equities, the FTSE All Share, to investment grade corporate bonds, 10 year government bonds, and a typical fixed term deposit, although it looks like, yeah, bingo, you want shares, the yield's not fabulous at 3.5%, but it beats the other asset classes, maybe that's not the whole picture. Why not? Well, it's not all about returns. If you're thinking, Basically, I have got an investable sum, I know my income requirement, and I want predictability about the capital I can draw off and when I can draw it off, then equities may not give that to you because dividends can be cut, suspended, yields can vary. But a portfolio of IOUs can, because there you know exactly and can predict exactly what the return will be. So if that's important to you, you can see that although the yield's lower on a bond portfolio, it might have a place in your drawdown strategy. So, is drawdown simple? No, actually it's quite complicated. To find out more, editor at killick.com and to watch related videos on what is a huge topic, killick.com forward slash learn.